Hello and welcome. My name is Danielle Blue Capolino. I'm delighted to be joining today's webinar entitled Food for Thought, an Appetite for Sustainable, Nutritious, and Plentiful, Plentiful Foods for a number of reasons. First of all, I'm joining you here from New York City where I am a registered dietitian, a nutritionist, and an author with a personal and professional interest in good nutrition and healthy eating for all. I'm also proudly a third generation Technion supporter. My mother, Laura Flug, who is on the line, is a member of the American Technion Society's National Board of Directors, and my beloved late grandfather, Joseph Gerwin, was a longtime supporter of the Technion. The Gerwin Tech Sat was the first micro satellite built and launched by students. It was named in his honor and remained operational for more than 11 years, which I recently learned is a world record for the longest running university satellite mission. My grandfather's example of philanthropy was profound and varied, and my mother and I proudly continue in his tradition, where, among other things, we continue to support Technion's faculty of food engineering and biotechnology. This is where today's guest speakers work, in areas related to personalized nutrition, bioflexibility, and food processing technologies. Professor Ori Lesmus heads the Technion Lab of Food Chemistry and Bioactives as well as the Food and Health Innovation Center, which supports research and development in Israel's food industry. <clears throat> he is also the academic leader of Israel's Pan-European Accelerator Network, aimed at promoting food entrepreneurs and startups. Concerned with healthy, affordable, and eco-friendly food choices, Professor Lesmus works on the rational design of foods personalized nutrition, and the safety of food additives. He will be joined by his colleague and collaborator, Professor Avi Spiegelman. Professor Spiegelman heads the Technion Laboratory for Novel Food and Bioprocessing and is a member at large of the Non-Thermal Processing Division of the U.S.-based Institute of Food Technologists. His lab integrates engineering, chemistry, biology, and microbiology to explore innovative food processing technologies and their effects on food ingredients and health. I've had the pleasure of meeting with Professor Lesmus on the Technion campus in Haifa, and I'm proud to consider him a colleague and friend. As a dietitian and nutritionist, I know all too well that many have difficulty determining which foods will enhance their health and which to avoid. In addition to that already <laughs> big issue. We are grappling with the fractures in our food supply chain that come to the forefront during this coronavirus pandemic and how that affected our product choices. I'm looking forward to hearing what our experts have to say on these topics, and I'm sure you'll have many questions for both Ori and Avi as well. As a housekeeping note, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the webinar window, and we will address all of your questions at the end of both presentations. My friend Pamela Wall, the American Technion Society Senior Director of Development based in Los Angeles, will join the program to moderate the Q&A. Ori and Avi, we're thrilled to have you with us today. The program is now all yours. So thank you very much, uh, Danielle, uh, for uh, the kind words and the invitation to give this talk. I'm very happy to host you all here at the Technion, although it is a virtual tour, but this is actual, uh, actually a real class, and it's a real privilege for me to try to share some of the research that we've been doing uh, in the past few years. And uh, today I want to take you on a journey. I want to take you on a journey not of answers, but rather of questions, of questions that stimulate science and stimulate our environment towards uh, the future, towards a better future. And today, even in the era of the coronavirus, uh, the importance of food has become unprecedented in, in people have put on the value 
of the food chain and the safety of the food chain and the security of the food chain. So I want to start off with uh, a very, uh, very famous uh, Latin uh, um, saying say, that uh, says, uh, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. And in this case, uh, this is part of what, what I, I'm aiming to do today with you guys. More than that, I want to take the opportunity to really and sincerely thank Danielle and her mother, Laura, for uh, their support of some of the research that you will be seeing here and for their continued uh, So without uh, with my own, sorry, with my own nutrition and food technology, an essential part. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, and I was raised in a very small village in the rural areas of Colombia called Vista Hermosa. Uh, and then we immigrated uh, as, a, as a family to Nazareth Elite here in the north of Israel. Uh, I uh, had the pleasure of traveling around with my parents. Both of them are physicians. So uh, uh, I had the pleasure of visiting the children's uh, uh, hospital in, in Boston. Uh, for some time while my, pa my dad was uh, working there. During my PhD here at the Technion, I had the pleasure of working in, in the UK. And after lecturer and uh, later as a uh, And to my first home, the north of Israel. Uh, which is where I have a family of three and a great spouse to support all of my uh, adventures here. But we wanted to talk a little bit about science. So let's talk about processed food and, and what people know and don't know about processed food and the role it plays in our life and in our health. So let's Foods are probably killing us. They make us fat, they give us cancer, they give us a lot of horrible, horrible things. And obviously that's always supported by uh, some study or a series of studies. But today I want to challenge those. I want to challenge your thought as well to dive deeper into the facts rather than the ideas because food is interwound deeply, deeply into our limbic system. We want food, we desire food. We, we think of food, for example, if we go out on a date, it's always something social, something emotional as well. And that is something that sometimes we have to disconnect when we think about food and nutrition and we sometimes have to stick to the facts rather than our feelings, our fears, or our emotions, or our beliefs. So I, I start off with uh, let's we let's discuss cultural organization, and they define something called ultra processed food. They define four classes of food that we'll discuss in a minute. But what concerns me most is the first sentence of this report, and that is that the most important factor when considering food nutrition and public health today should be not nutrients and not the foods themselves. Is a bunch of chemicals that we introduce into our body. Therefore, the history of these chemicals is just one of the determinants of what these chemicals will do. The, the identity of the chemicals, meaning the composition of the food and the structure of the food, are the other one. And they should never be neglected. Almost a decade ago, stimulated a lot of debate around 
whether we should have processed food or whether we should have a food industry at large. They even met, took it to a ne next level and they advised people to avoid ultra processed foods. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll see that this notion is actually quite dangerous. Example at the exa an example of how ultra-processed foods have been linked to obesity. A lot of people may say ultra-processed food cause obesity. This study looked at the UK story and they looked at the diets in, in the UK. And they looked at what are the odds, what, what's the risk of people to become obese when having a diet. And as you can see, the differences between the different diets and their, their Ray, ability to mitigate. Uri, you are cutting off constantly. I suggest we switch now and I will do my part and you will take it to the office because you are constantly broken off. Okay. Okay, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Sorry for this uh, interference. Uh, we will do a little switch. I will uh, give my part of the presentation. It's a little based on his part, but it should be fine. And I hope you will understand the relation. Okay, so I hope now uh, every, everything is well and you see me fine. And uh, again, I would like to thank uh, the Laura Flag Fund for, for, for the support of my research and also to the Firefly Scientist Fund that uh, supported part of my equipment funding. When we are often talking about uh, food processing, there is a common misconception that, this, that food processing only occurs at the stage of the processing in the plant. But actually, a lot of the effects that will happen to the food nutrients will not occur during uh, this part. They will often occur when we pick the tomato or the grape, when we transport it to the processing plant, when we put it in the refrigerator, and we already know that there is a major effect if it's stored at four degrees or six degrees uh, Celsius, when it's heated in the oven, when it's fried or cooked or boiled, and at the end, there, of course, there is a major impact to the processing, and it is a completely processing uh, uh, part that happens in our body. And when we wish to discuss and to design uh, food processing uh, for optimal health, we need, of course, to make sure that the food that we provide is safe. That's the basis. But then we ha also need to balance a lot of both. We need to balance the flavor and the, and the needs of the persons consuming it, the color, the health properties, the texture. Every one of us likes a specific texture of the food. Of course, the taste and the quality. And to do all of this, we need to play around with processing. And very often, thermally, thermal processing is not popular. We know it, and you can hear it quite well in the, on, the, on the internet, people saying we want unprocessed food. But actually processing, thermally processing food, especially was crucial uh, to our development. And I'm sure Uri will talk about, we'll talk about it uh, more quite soon. And we know that then the many uh, various uh, thermal processing of food are actually very efficient in killing microbials, of course, providing the safety, but also to increase the bioavailability of many nutrients. There are a few downsides. Of course, the loss of the original flavor, the loss of uh, taste, the loss of appearance, some losses of nutritional quality, but I can tell you that very often it's overappreciated, and the loss of uh, nutritional value. 
especially with the development in various novel thermal processing that allow us to, uh, to cure the microorganism very quickly, the upside of thermal processing, and I'm saying it clearly despite the fact that I study non-thermal processing, are very high. And I also want to mention, we, we said that in the presentation that we, it will be a misconception about uh, food processing. You can say a lot in the internet that people want to drink raw milk and not pasteurized. At, at the same time, the same people will often use it to add it to coffee. So just to have some proportion, pasteurization of milk is done at uh, 163 degrees Fahrenheit for uh, uh, 10, 15 seconds. It will spend, uh, the milk will spend much more time in your coffee at a much higher temperature than, than the pasteurization itself. But indeed, we want to preserve food. This is very important and it's uh, been uh, developed for, for ages now. In the past, we were uh, using vinegar and salt to, re to, to prepare for winter, to prepare our food, to preserve our food for times that we could not even grow the food. Now the reasoning for preservation are different. We want to have food that is easy to use. We want to have food that is very tasty. So we have developed novel and uh, processing technology. And there are quite a few novel processing technologies. You can very broadly define them as non-thermal technologies, meaning that minimal heat is applied during this technology, and to uh, electro technologies that actually use heat, but in a different way than the regular heating. And you can have, see here quite a list. You can see the same ultrasound technology that is used uh, when you are uh, looking, uh, when you are pregnant, but of course in much higher intensities, and we have pulse electric fields, that is a method developed in, for uh, biological pur purposes for uh, gene editing, and is currently being used for food preservation, and of course the ozone treatment, and we have microwave heating, and the industry uses microwave heating not only for the for domestic heating, but for uh, heating inside the processing plant because it can heat the food quicker and then uh, the heat transfer problem is minimized and we have ohmic heating and we have RF heating, very different and promising technologies, but I have to be frank. Most of them are not, are only mildly used by the industry because thermal processing is really good. And even when you see the non-thermal one, most of them, including pulse electric fields, including the ultrasound, we still have some thermal effect. A few really, one really non-thermal method is high pro pressure processing. This is the main method that I study. There are actually two high pressure uh, technologies. The hydrostatic one that, that actually it can be very simply explained as we took, as we take a product, put it in a, in a lot of water and then pressurize this water to obtain very high pressure that can kill the microorganism. Or high pressure homogenization, which is very similar to the regular homogenization that all the milk is going through, but at much higher pressure. And because of the higher pressure, we are obtaining an increase uh, microbial inactivation, which is of course good from the safety point of view. When we want just to have a feeling about how large are the pressures we are considering, so a rough estimation would be for high pressure processing is to put three elephants on the surface area of approximately one quarter. This will be equal to six, up to 700 megapascal. And it is six times more than the highest, than the pressure and the lowest place in the ocean. High pressure homogenization, on the other hand, is much, is a little bit lower. It's 400 megapascal maximum. 
but it has a completely different mechanism of action. When we talk about hydrostatic high pressure processing, there are already quite a lot of products, of course, in the US market, and it's all started with this one, with the avocado, with the guacamole. Why? A very simple reason. If you want to heat up avocado, it will not uh, be quite uh, uh, acceptable by the consumer. It will become dark. So thermal processing was not an efficient method to preserve avocado and avocado paste. High pressure, on the other hand, does not cause it, and then it can be used. But in high pressure processing, we have many different uh, products that are considered premium products, and indeed, from the sens sensory uh, point of view, they are quite superior to the uh, conventionally thermally processed products when they are available, for example, in the case of juice. So we are studying also the utilization of high pressure processing, but we are not studying actually if it can preserve uh, the product, if it can induce microbial inactivation, because there is a lot of research going on this point, and to my understanding, not enough of novel utilization of the novel technology. So novel, thing we can, novel things we can achieve by using those technologies. For example, we wanted to see in the past, can the fact that by high pressure homogenization, we get very, very small droplets of the oil in milk, can this be used to increase the stability during shelf life of uh, vitamin, uh, of the vitamin riboflavin in milk? Because it is a very light sensitive uh, compound that degrades uh, quite efficiently uh, during storage, especially when it's not in dark in a, in a, in a dark in dark storage, so we increased the pressure, uh, and we saw the expected decrease in the sizes of the fat globules inside the milk, and we also saw a decrease in the degradation rate. So we suggested that by decreasing the particle size in milk because of increased light scattering we can decrease the degradation of, uh, of riboflavin. We also use the same technology to see if we can increase the sustainability and the health properties of strawberry nectar. Strawberry nectar that is uh, often uh, consumed uh, worldwide is actually a filtered, it's filtered to remove the seeds, the small seeds, which are named the acnea from the strawberry. But the issue is that in those seeds, there are a lot of polyphenols. And you should remember this word, because I will talk a lot about polyphenols. I really like this topic. So again, we applied high pressure homogenization for systems that, for nectar that included the, uh, the seeds, because we do not want to waste them. And then we studied, first of all, how it affects the structure of uh, the juice, of the nectar, and then Will it help us to get more polyphenols in our diet? And as expectedly, of course, particles became smaller. You can see this in the very nice microscopy images here and also here. But unfortunately, and I have to say, the stability of this drink decreased. The physical stability, it separated quicker. On the other hand, when we, when we looked at the content of the polyphenols, we saw a constant increase with increasing cycles at 200 megapascal, allowing us to increase the level of the levels of polyphenols by 30 percent, which is quite extensive. We also thinking about the fact that we do not want to engineer our process just for the maximum stability of the uh, of the compounds in the product. We should actually aim at uh, engineering the process to, have, to give the maximum health benefit. And to do so, we should also take into account the digestion. Again, I am a, a big fan of polyphenols. They are very potent antioxidants and they have numerous uh, 
health effects in your body. But the truth is, when you when some people start, studied their uh, bioaccessibility and bioavailability in the past, they have noticed that the bioavailability of those compounds is extremely low. It can reach one or two or three percent uh, in the main uh, region where uh, compounds are observed, which is the small intestine. So we decided to try it and study it in very simple systems that contain only polyphenols and, and some cellular material of plants to give it a similarity to well-processed uh, uh, well well, uh, uh, juice or nectar. And anthocyanins is one group of the polyphenols. I will not discuss all the polyphenols. And we saw some very important uh, points. First of all, the processing, the different processing times if it was thermal or high pressure, had a major impact on the relative bioaccessibility in the, in the stomach. With high pressure processing, it pro provides a significantly larger uh, bioaccessibility of, of those co compounds, the compounds responsible for the color of strawberries and many other similar products. Uh, on the other hand, when we are reaching the intestine, the small intestine when th where those components should be absorbed, the difference between uh, the different processing conditions is became, became very small. And you can see also the bioaccessibility is actually getting much, much smaller. So what we can understand from that, that pro processing, the type of processing has an impact, but it will not necessarily significantly modify the bioaccessibility of the original compound. The main question that stands before us now is what happens in the small intestine, at the large intestine, sorry. At the large, everything that was not absorbed in the small, in the small intestine will reach the, the large intestine. And when it reaches the large intestine, it will undergo different enzymatic and non-enzymatic transformation to different compounds with potential health benefits. And this might explain why polyphenols and, and consumption of polyphenols rich food is healthy, but, we, but despite the fact that the bioavailability of the original compounds is very low. We also wanted to study more complex systems, not just the strawberry. What happens if we mix them up with kale? Kale is very interesting because it's healthy, but also because relatively for plant-based material, it has high protein content. And we saw that indeed the type processing has a major impact on, this, on the sedimentation that occurs due to binding of polyphenols to the, to the protein in the original product. With HPP, with high pressure processing, provides very similar values to the completely unprocessed product. So they are quite similar. On the other hand, thermal processing and pulse electric fields result in increase in sedimentation. But again, when we look at the antioxidant capacity occurring during digestion, as a rough estimation for the release of the polyphenols, we see that the processing already has minimal impact. There is no difference between the different processing uh, types. And we see an increase in the antioxidant capacity during digestion. Now, the last uh, slide that I, will that I will share is the question, can we apply the preservation technologies as a tool to develop new foods from sustainable sources? This is spirulina. You probably have heard about it. It's a very uh, interesting uh, microalgae. It has a lot of protein, which is good. And the protein itself is extremely, has a very high antioxidative level, which is also good. But it's not very useful uh, except in shakes currently by the, uh, by the food processing uh, and by the food uh, engineers. So we are trying to manipulate by extraction and by processing, in, by, by, by processing technologies to, 
to manipulate the structure of the proteins to allow us to obtain texture. For example, here you can see that after some processing, we, we, we can obtain a gel-like uh, product uh, from the spirulina uh, protein. This is a potato waste, potato peel waste. You can extract from it quite an extensive amount of protein. And we are studying, can we use high pressure processing to obtain a tofu-like product, but uh, from uh, the proteins in this waste. And we, were and we were able to achieve quite a nice gel and with a great advantage that if we incorporate into this gel heat liable compounds, then we can also preserve such heat liable compounds and it can be anything from vitamins to polyphenols to practically numerous amounts of compounds. But we can preserve them because we do not need to apply heat during the formation of uh, the gel-like structure. And we're also trying to see, can we make a yogurt out of it? And how can we make it? So I hope you enjoyed my part of the presentation. I know it's a little bit backward, and now I will gladly give Uri the chance to present his slides. Yes, well, uh, I think uh, I'm taking you to a real journey throughout the Technion. Now we're, uh, we've jumped to my office. Uh, so, uh, and, and I'll we'll try to return to where we were. So just to recap, uh, I was discussing uh, the, uh, ultra, the concept of processed foods and ultra processed foods and their links to health. In this case, uh, we were uh, mentioning the UK diet and how uh, there is actually no link between uh, the classification of UK diets and the, the, the ratio or the chances of people developing overweight or, or, or cases of obesity. If you look closely, uh, people that were consuming unprocessed or minimally processed foods had the chance of, uh, uh, in this case, defined as, as a 100% chance. And, uh, the same uh, chances were actually for uh, people eating ultra processed foods, according to the definition that was set up by uh, the FAO committee uh, almost a decade ago. Uh, so you see that sometimes the facts do not support notions and, and, and fear. So let's go back to hi in history now and think, uh, why did we start processing foods and, and how did, did that affect us? So if we look, uh, we are part of the uh, larger Homo sapiens species or larger apes, and, uh, but we are the dominant one here on this planet. If we look closely, our human brain is about 2% of our, of our body mass, but it consumes almost a quarter of the energy that we, uh, uh, that we intake, meaning that it is metabolically very, very, uh, a very expensive organ. And why is that? Because processing helped us unleash the human potential. Because if you look about 100,000 years ago, we were just a bunch of apes. And then we discovered fire. We started to thermally process foods. We started to increase food safety by using fire to kill bacteria, even without knowing that bacteria were there. So increasing the food safety. Uh, decreasing morbidity and, uh, and uh, everything associated with the consumption of bad foods, we increased the bioaccessibility or the access, uh, our ability, uh, the human body's ability to extract nutrients from foods. Therefore, we had enough calories to survive and we were at a surplus of calories that enabled us to develop higher brain functions. So these apes that started cooking, they actually cooked up good ideas and they started to evolve, to evolve into Homo sapiens. So where are we now? What's, what's in it for good food? So uh, let's start with an example you, most of you probably at least heard of, and that is Israeli couscous. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the story of Israeli couscous. Here it's called Ben-Gurion rice. 
And it actually started uh, uh, back when Israel didn't have enough food to provide for uh, the, in the new state back in the 50s. They didn't have enough food. So Prime Minister Ben-Gurion uh, asked the, one of the food engineers in Israel to try to engineer an alternative to rice. And they came up with what you probably know now as the Israeli couscous or in Hebrew ptitim, which is an alternative. And this is a, a, what is called a heavily processed product. But once again, it helped Israel struggle through the, uh, the, the need to cope with the, the ration of foods. So Uri, let's, yeah. Please share your screen. I'm not sharing. Hold on. So the, the Israeli couscous uh, that you see here uh, in the center of, uh, is just an example of processed foods that we all enjoy. And I wanted to list a few of the benefits of, the, of, of food processing. And with that, we start off with food safety. We're talking about pasteurized uh, uh, pro products like pasteurized milk. Uh, sterilized products. Uh, even uh, with the corona outbreak, you saw people standing in line and buying uh, canned soup uh, and, and all sort of canned tuna, uh, etc. Why? Because these are, they have a long shelf life and they are safe foods that can be preserved for a very long uh, period of time. So food preservation is a definite benefit for food processing. It offers us convenience and accessibility of a lot of foods that we can sometimes find very hard to find in our vicinity. Okay, we're talking about people at Bill Gates not worrying about where his next meal would come from. So he had time to think of uh, Microsoft and, 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 and all the technology around it. Uh, so we're talking about an enabling technology. Food processing is actually an enabling technology that helps us maintain this modern life. We're talking about labeling. How many uh, of you read the labels on, on, on foods? 200 years ago, people had to play a guessing game before they, they, they ate. And right now we're also talking about foods as, as a preventive measure to prevent the onset of disease and to alleviate certain diseases, or sometimes even just a, 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 ensure the wellness of people. And this is part of my own interest because I'm deeply interested in what happens when we consume food. Because the human gut has evolved to process processed foods. We don't have the dental anatomy for uh, very, very fibrous uh, uh, foods or to tear meat from a dead animal. So we are not, we are the only species actually on this planet that lives off cooked food. Our digestive functions have evolved accordingly, our immune functions. Our biggest immune organ is actually dispersed along the gastrointestinal tract. Our neural functions, we don't just have a big brain to think with. We also have a smaller brain in our gut. So all of you business people thinking, uh, okay, I know a gut feeling, this is part of it, but uh, seriously, there is an autonomous brain operating in the gut, sensing the chemical composition of foods and their, their structures, etc., cetera, giving, big, giving the big brain uh, signals of hunger, satiety, etc. And we're also talking about our coexistence with a lot of bacteria that reside in our body and have a tremendous effect on our life and on our health. So, as a scientist, I'm, ob I'm obliged to try to understand how food is digested. And for that, uh, we try to understand or to lay the foundations for what we call nutritional engineering or reverse engineering of foods, trying to understand how foods get broken down in the human gastrointestinal tract. And through those sort of insights, try to backtrack into what sort of food is right for that person or for that class of people, for that strata of the human population. And we're trying to look into different 
parts of the human population because even when we go to buy clothes, we know that a one size fits all is not the best way to go. And this is how we're treating food. Because if you think about it, a supermarket does not look like um, a Marshall's. There's no aisles according to sizes or to preferences. You just have aisles according to topics of food. And this is something that drives me in my research. And this is why, for example, we've been looking into ensuring protein delivery to seniors. When people reach a certain age, their muscles start to uh, lose mass because of physiological changes. So they need to change their nutrition, but they don't want to change their lifestyle. They don't want to start eating baby formula when they become 70 or 80 year old. They want to keep eating pastrami. They want to eat pizza. They want to have all the choices that they had when they were 20, 30, and 40. They want to have these same choices when they reach old age. And we want to ensure that. So in, in my story, we were interested in ensuring the delivery of protein because this is one of the major challenges uh, with seniors. So we looked at two uh, whey proteins. One is called uh, alpha-lactalbumin, the other one is beta-lactoglobulin and how they are digested in, a, in the dynamic conditions of a healthy adult gut. And, uh, and a healthy adult is defined in science as somebody between 20 and 40. According to, uh, to this data, Alpha-lactalbumin gets degraded pretty fast and it's called a fast digesting protein. So this would be very advisable to give this protein to an elderly person that needs a, a very fast digesting protein. But the truth is that when we go to an elderly gut to look what happens to the, the same proteins, we receive something that is counterintuitive where a protein that for a healthy adult gets degraded very at a very slow rate, actually becomes highly accessible to a senior and vice versa. We have things like alpha-lactalbumin and other proteins that get digested very, very efficiently in a healthy adult, but become very hard to digest for elderly people. So we need to think, we need to start thinking in, in terms of what do we really want to deliver? Because we want to not just deliver a promise. We really want to be effective in what we provide people. So just looking at the healthy life cycle from infancy to old age, we, we have to address the fact that people change and people are different even in the same group age. Males and females, people from different ethnicities have different tendencies to break down food and to respond to different nutrients. And we need to take that into account. We also need to take into account different lifestyles and the fact that we need to look for novel protein sources because not everybody wants to eat uh, beef, pork, um, or anything. So uh, if you look closely, uh, the ones of you following uh, NBA will understand my excitement of this situation. This, is a, this was actually a picture taken in my office with uh, the visit of, uh, of uh, Ben Wallace. Uh, an, ABA, an NBA uh, all-star uh, player. And uh, uh, he was here at the Technion visiting and exploring uh, uh, insects and uh, good ideas for uh, new uh, innovations in food. And uh, this actual uh, research was uh, during that time was actually supported by the Laura Flug uh, Family Fund. Uh, and we were looking into how can we try to introduce insects as an animal, as an alternative animal source into the Western diet, because uh, most Westerners usually are, are deterred from uh, eating insects because they are considered dirty or um, disgusting, but they are just another form of an animal that we can eat. Uh, so we need to remove this insect appearance. So, uh, and we need to think, okay, who really can benefit from this uh, uh, protein? In this case, uh, elderly actually digest pro uh, some of those proteins uh, actually more efficiently than uh, healthy adults. And we said, okay, so how can we, what can we do to offer something outside the box? And we made an ice cream. We made an ice cream that is protein added, with, and if you'd like, fortified with protein from insects. Uh, and the most important thing about this ice cream is that it tastes 
great. It, it, it was really, really well accepted by a panel of, of, of tasters, over 40 different people coming into the Technion, uh, students and, and staff, uh, tasting professionally, tasting this ice cream and giving us the thumbs up that uh, this is not just a good idea on paper, but rather uh, also a tasty one. Because at the end, food needs to provide us with not just nutrition, but also with comfort, with, with good provision of a lifestyle. And we've also been looking into lipids uh, because lipids provide us with a lot of calories. So in the case of elderly, we also need to supplement their diet with higher calorie intake. Uh, unlike young people and obesity cases where we want to go for low calorie foods, in this case, we want to go for actually for high calorie, highly dense uh, uh, foods so that every bite is actually very effective in delivering calories to the elderly, which is a quite of a challenge because with old age comes a deterioration also of, of appetite and, and other things. So uh, we've been able to manipulate dietary fibers uh, to varying extents to either increase or decrease uh, the, uh, the digestion of lipids and the caloric value of foods that are ingested in the human body. So uh, trying to sum up uh, this uh, thought for food and food for thought, I wanted to draw your attention that this is a complex world of choices. Uh, even if we try to, uh, as this study uh, uh, recently shown, uh, even if we try to supplement the diet of elderly people with protein, it's usually not enough. So we really want to think of processing as, uh, or ultra processed foods as the cause of all evil in, in the Western world. But it's not just that, it's the choices that we make. It's not the food's fault. It's us, the way we live, our food choices, and the fact that the food industry is trying to provide us with a broader scope of options is not something that we should fear. It's something that we should embrace. We should do it carefully. We should really study this and to, uh, to varying extents of how this is uh, affecting us. But we need to understand that what we put in our body is not just that. We also need to exercise. And in this case, uh, this is exactly what is proven here with a systematic review of different studies showing that if we give seniors more protein, it's not enough, they need to exercise. So it's about life's choices. And the food industry actually facilitates our life in the modern world. And we also need to think that we are not the only ones here. There are also people in Guatemala that uh, are not getting enough food, especially uh, now with Corona around. We're talking about people in Africa that are not getting enough protein. Southeast Asia. So we need to think of how we are distributing food globally as well, and not just locally. So these are part uh, of the things that I would like you to, uh, to think of uh, after this webinar, uh, uh, because there is enough protein in the Western world, but there is a lack of protein, for example, in Africa. So these are things that we should carefully think of trying to be more effective, trying to make this world a better place. And this is at least my own personal uh, uh, intake of things um, to trying to conclude this journey. And the fact that I'm sitting here in my office is actually a nice closure because this is exactly why I came to the Technion. I came here to make a difference. I came here to work with good people that are highly devoted to their work and to using foods not to do bad, but rather than to do good, to affect people's lives to the better and to do our best while doing it. So I hope you enjoyed this, this talk and, and uh, any questions are now uh, more than welcome. Danielle, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ori and Avi for incredibly interesting presentations, both of you. Um, actually a lot of questions and my favorite pun a lot of you've given us a lot of food for thought and uh okay here's my first question Ori, where can we get 
to try your insect ice cream and what insect are you using? Okay, so uh, first of all, insects you can actually, Danielle, you can even find in New York. <laughs> we have a second. No, those we don't eat. <laughs> no, actually, it's good that I'm in my office. I'll bring this closer to the camera so you can all see. This is actually something that my father got me in New York. <laughs> and this is sold and they are completely edible. Uh, this is uh, the form that is harder to digest for most Western people uh, because the crickets actually look like crickets. Uh, the case of the ice cream is actually based on worms. <laughs> Silk worms, to be exact. Uh, they are actually dried. Uh, and uh, your face is actually uh, the, the, mo the most natural way most Westerners react when I tell them that this is the ice cream. But the ice cream, uh, the, the worms are actually uh, pulverized into a very fine powder. And because they are dried, and they are actually half baked. They uh, they give off an off uh, uh, not an off, but rather a flavor that looks like that re resembles that of a cookie. If you know uh, gingerbread okay. cookies, yeah, it's very very similar to lotus cookies, uh, gingerbread cookies. So what we were able to do is actually find the right culinary combination with uh, vanilla ice cream to give most people the sense that this was a vanilla ice cream with added cookies. So our, our study actually showed that half of the people when they were not told that this was an ice cream that contained uh, um, worms, they actually really favored the ice cream and they were certain that this is a great ice cream, irrespective of the fact even after they were told that, the, that it contained worms, they said, yeah, but it, it tasted fine. It was great. <laughs> now I see that Pam has joined us on the screen. So it is my pleasure then to officially welcome Pamela Wall, ATS Senior Director of Development, who will moderate this Q&A session with Uri and Avi. I see that there are a bunch of questions that have been popping up here. So I think we will answer as many as we can and um, take it from here. Thank you so much, both of you. Yes, thank you uh, so much, Danielle, and thank you again for the support of you and your family for the many generations, and thank you, Uri and Avi, for being with us. We certainly do have a number of questions. Um, the first one that I will pose to both Uri and Avi um, is that many on TV may have been supporting the importance of intestinal health by ingesting various products or plant foods to enhance digestion and promote health. Um, I know you've touched upon this, or are there some kind of substances, extracts that you are recommending or researching in your labs to increase health? Avi, if that's okay, I'll, I think I can jump in on this one. Uh, actually, actually, the plant-based or the uh, plant-based protein as an alternative to animal protein is a very strong trend uh, globally. Uh, when, when thinking about the nutritional values, it's actually quite of a challenge because the quality, for example, the protein quality of plants in terms of digestibility and nutritional quality is inferior to that of animals. So we are better equipped in terms of, 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 uh, uh, of being apes. We are better, we have evolved to be better at digesting animals. That's one thing. The other thing is that a lot of the plants actually contain intrinsic chemicals like polyphenols that are actually healthy for us, but at the same time, they have anti-nutritional effects and they inhibit the breakdown of proteins. So if, if we think in the broad perspective, we need to focus first on macronutrients. So when we think about plants, they're we need to eat more protein. So in the prospect of, of sustainability, it seems like there is a need to carefully balance the human diet between animal and plant. And obviously, are, are there any, are there any, I think this person was also asking if there are any specific supplements that you recommend 
turmeric. So, so I would like to add some, something about the gut health. We don't know enough. We know that some extent of fiber is needed in our diet. So that means polysaccharide. That we know quite for sure. Uh, we, ca we are quite close to be sure that protein that rich in the, the large intestine is not a good idea. And I have seen also in the chat uh, questions about uh, various uh, plant-based alternative products. We, I cannot tell for sure that there, it is a problem, but there is a high chance that it is. Uh, and we have very little understanding about the effects, really true scientific validated understanding about the effects of small compounds on the, on the gut health. So there is quite a lot uh, to study more. So I cannot suggest any additives and be, sh be sure about it, but I can suggest having enough fiber in your diet. This is true. Okay. I'll second that opinion. The one thing that we can tell everyone that we know is healthy is to eat more fiber. Exactly. That, that's one of the things that is missing in a lot of the Western type diets. No. Uh, across nations, uh, many, many studies show that. Uh, we are way below on that. Uh, a, a normal, healthy uh, adult should eat around 25 grams of fiber per day. Uh, and in most countries, we are at somewhere between five to 10. So we are uh, scratching it from the well below values. So that's always uh, something good. Uh, as Avi was mentioning, more and more studies support the fact that uh, having a, a fiber rich diet actually promotes good activity in the gut. Uh, and that's been associated with various uh, healthy conditions. Uh, contrary to that, uh, a lot of protein or excess protein uh, actually has its uh, drawbacks in trying to uh, create a dysbiosis in the, in, the, in the gut and also affecting renal functions. Uh, so having too much of, any, of something is always a bad idea. And, uh, currently, the, the, currently, the industry is pushing towards too much protein. Exactly, because this is a, a, a consumer demand that is not supported by facts. This is a, what we call a trend where people are looking for a higher protein diets, where in the most of the Western countries, people are actually consuming an excess of protein. Uh, so we should be very, very careful. A, a 70 kilogram weighing adult should probably be eating somewhere around 50 to 70 grams of protein per day, okay? So, and most Western countries, we consume around 70 to 100 grams, and that de depends on what people eat. So uh, no need to rush off to, to eat uh, more protein. That's actually uh, now more and more associated with ill effects of, uh, of uh, the gut. Mm. How would an average person know how much protein they're eating? Or is there any practical advice you can give to the... Read the labels. Just follow the labels. That's one of the great things that uh, uh, the food industry offers people. They are empowering consumers to know exactly how much they're putting into their body. So you just have to read. Uh, it's actually quite clear uh, in the U.S. especially, it's very, very bold and it's just in your face when you just flip the, the, the product and you see it. Protein, fiber, sugar, you see it all, it's just out there. And if it's not, if it doesn't have a label, you can Google it. Yeah, you can very easily Google it. The FDA and the USDA have very, very good databases on practically almost any type of food you can find in the U.S. Mm. And so with regards, uh, you know, obviously we're in the middle of this pandemic and food 
supplies have been affected, supply chain, you've touched upon that. Um, this really is for both Uri and Avi. How do you see your work playing into that as benefiting and helping and, and really your work in the future as a part of this, you know, supply chain? Can I start? Sure. Uh, well, there are some points that I can already see going on. First of all, people want to have the possibility to buy shelf-stable food, meaning not only really raw product and not only the ones that need refrigeration. And I think it will give back some credit to the highly thermally treated products, although they are not very popular, but in reality, they provide very good nutrition, definitely of the micronutrients, and can be used quite safely from many aspects. And on the other side, uh, there is a notion that the development of various pandemics is related to the fact that we are overusing the land and we are overusing the land because we need to uh, have enough space for the cows and for the pork and for the animals. And I'm quite certain that, the, uh, that in addition to the moral uh, concerns of people of eating animal or animal-based product, and that includes also milk and many other cheeses, there will be a growing trend to improve the diversity of the possibilities of animal replacement of for protein. And that will require quite a lot of research in understanding how it will really affect our body. As just Uri mentioned, plant-based are not digested as animal-based. And that might mean that it will reach the large intestine. And that might mean it will result in dysbiosis. And we don't really know what what it will what will happen to our health. If I can add to that, I, while Avi was talking, I just googled something, uh, and I'll just share my screen with all of you. So uh, just to show you something that I'd like to to mention. So if you if you're seeing my screen right now, you'll see uh, uh, the Locust Watch for the FAO of the United Nations. Uh, locust is actually uh, a lemon, if you'd like, but you can turn lemons into lemonade, right? So locust can be eaten. It's actually very rich in protein. Uh, and if it can be controlled and harvested, countries that are mentioned here, like Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, India, Pakistan, that are infected with locusts, would actually harness technology to control locust situations and actually transform them into a protein source. So you see how by using technology and using concepts that are actually uh, out there always, we can think of uh, trying to have solutions to problems around us. More than that, uh, extending Avi's comment, technology is actually uh, the solution to the, the food challenges we're seeing. If you look into the COVID uh, uh, challenges, blockchain, for example, how do you manage, uh, uh, how do you manage logistical uh, food supply chains? Uh, I recall when I was living in the States, uh, I was very proud to be eating uh, bananas from Costa Rica and Guatemala. Uh, but what happens if uh, all borders close? No bananas for anyone. So uh, how can we overcome this? We need to be wiser. We also need to think ecologically because most of the pork eaten today in China is actually grown in Brazil. A lot of the beef consumed in the US is actually grown in Australia. So if you just think into how much the food chain is polluting the world just by moving food sources around. That's a huge, a huge change that we can make. So the opportunities 
are, uh, are actually infinite in my opinion. The question is, can we harness real thought and facts and to get the right things done, to harness technologies, to make it a better price for all of us? Yeah, well, I have, I have no doubt that the two of you and your labs and your department will certainly be ahead of this. The Technion is at the forefront of this and we have great faith and just, we wanna be respectful to everyone's time. So we, we know we have a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we will need to end the Q&A here, but we're, we will certainly share all of the questions with the professors and get answers back to you. Um, and I wanna turn this back to Danielle. Thank you so much, Pam, and thank you again to Uri and Avi. This has been really fascinating. I could definitely stay on the line and talk for another hour. And Uri, I send you an email. I need to talk to you about the locust thing. I'm working on a separate project. Um, <laughs> you've given us a great deal of food for thought. This is really important. We're very thankful. Note to everyone on, who's still on the call, this presentation has been recorded and a link. Um, will be sent to you within the next couple of days so you can see a recording. Thank you for bearing with us and our technical difficulties. We did our best and we will be in touch with you to let you know the date of our next webinar. In the meantime, thank you so much again for joining us and for your support of the Technion. Stay safe. Stay safe, everyone, and have a great thank day. Thank you very much for joining us.